So in the interest of using our time to the, to the max, I just want to say one thing, that one of the most extraordinary aspects of this institute um, is the extent to which funding and collaborations are spawned from MCHRI to other departments, other laboratories, other centers across the campus. Uh, my own Center in Population Health Sciences has been a beneficiary, and we actually continue to benefit in oh so many ways. So we're going to introduce four, four speakers this morning who are coming from a uh, slightly different context, although the first is a member of the Department of, uh, of Pediatrics, well known to you, Gary Darmstadt. But Gary is, is actually working primarily in the, um, in the context of, uh, of global health. He's uh, done an enormous amount of work in the area that he's going to discuss with you this morning, gender norms. Gary. Mark, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And, and uh, Tony and other members of MCHRI, thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, to present this exciting work. Uh, we're going to take a bit of a turn. And here we've been talking a lot about our biology. And I'm going to be talking a lot about how our, our environment ultimately affects our biology. And that environment is mediated uh, through our gender and how people perceive us because of their perception around our gender. And so I'm going to be looking at the influence of norms that are all around us, that, that we're all experiencing every day, and how those norms actually get under our skin, getting back to the skin metaphor, uh, and impact our health. Let's see. So th this work was part of a Lancet series, uh, which was about a three, four year endeavor, uh, about a, f a $4 million endeavor funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the United, United Arab Emirates government. Uh, the outcomes ultimately were five papers uh, in the Lancet series, which, in which we tried to really capture what this field is about, summarize the evidence, and then try to move the field to a new place. And, and I will be focusing a bit on the ways in which we began to look at data, existing survey data, in a new way to try to gain insights into how norms are affecting our health. Because it turns out there really are, are there's zero measures in the literature on norms per se. So we need to infer where they're acting, and I'll, I'll lead you through that. Uh, we have 30 other supplemental papers in various other journals that are, are uh, in various stages of being published. Uh, to accomplish this work, this is a work of over 100 people across 40 different organizations and five continents. And in the process, we produced a uh, what we're calling a gender data hub within PHS. We had a very close collaboration with population health sciences around this body of work, and these data are re residing uh, within PHS. So what we were really aiming to do here was to bring science, to bring evidence around how gender inequalities and norms uh, impact our health. There's a great deal of qualitative uh, literature on this topic, but we were really uh, interested in trying to look at these issues quantitatively and, and, and try to really understand the magnitude of these kinds of effects. Uh, we looked for opportunities uh, ultimately really to make a difference. How do we shape programs? How do we shape policies? How do we shape organizations in order to address restrictive gender norms and gender inequalities and improve health? And in the process to really get people to work together in new ways, to get cross-disciplinary collaborations, and to get people to think and act in different ways. So this is very briefly a rough down of the papers that we had. The first one, we, we took a historical perspective. Uh, we looked at the existing evidence on how norms and inequalities impact our health, and we developed a conceptual framework that, that lays this out, which I'll uh, take you through. Uh, the second paper was really um, largely driven here at Stanford with collaborations around the world, looking at existing survey data. Uh, and then the third paper looks at what, what is the evidence of what actually works if, if we are implementing programs if we're implementing policies, what actually works to affect uh, gender equalities and norms. Uh, the fourth takes a look at health systems. What are ways in which systems are biased? How do systems interact with us as uh, 
male, female? How do we interact with those systems depending on our gender? And how are those interactions biased? And how does that impact our health? And how can we disrupt those interactions and make them more health promoting? And then the fifth uh, paper brings it all together and asks what can we really do now to change the situation? I'm going to focus um, my talk uh, today really mostly on the second paper and the third paper. Uh, I want to briefly, though, walk you through the conceptual framework just so that you understand the, the framing that we're bringing to this issue. Now, norms are things that are often unspoken. They're all around us. We're perceiving them. Uh, and there are ways in which societies essentially govern our behavior by letting us know what's acceptable and what's not, and putting guardrails uh, around us. We're all perceiving these things, we're all affected by them. And those guardrails extend all the way from maybe a disapproving glance to hate crimes and murder. And we see this around us, around the world, all the time. Our conceptual framework, uh, based on our review of the literature uh, uh, shown here, where we start out uh, as, a, as having sex-based differences in our health. We've heard quite a bit about that already this morning. We then enter into a, into a society, uh, and this even happens before we're born, but through interactions within our family, within our communities, within institutions like our schools, our workplace, through structural forces like policies, uh, laws, et cetera, we are shaped and socially produced to express gender in a particular way. We then interact with other aspects of our identity, be it race, socioeconomic status, our class, et cetera, and it's through that social production of gender and these intersecting, um, in some cases, intersecting disadvantages that we're facing. If you're a poor black woman in America, for example, you have a compounding disadvantage. Uh, we then interact with the health system and uh, our, our gender and our way in which we interact that, with that system um, is expressed in health through differences in exposure, in our behaviors, in our access to the system, in the way the system interacts with us when, when we seek help from that system. And this then produces gender-based disparities or inequities in our health. Rather than differences based on sex, we're now talking about inequities based on gender. And that's what we're going to explore now. The first evidence I wanted to talk with you about is first, let, let's take a look at what do we know about what works uh, to influence gender norms or gender inequalities and produce impacts on health. We set out to do a systematic review of all the literature that, uh, that used rigorous methods to evaluate the impact of programs that aim to transform gender norms or gender relations in some way and, and measure impacts on health. And th this chart here on your right just shows that there's a wide range of programmatic activities, of gender-related measures, and of health outcomes that were measured. And we tried to bring some order to this literature in a very comprehensive and systematic way, which hadn't really been done before. Uh, we came up with 87 evaluations across all ages and 61 of adolescents, and the we found, not unexpectedly, that most of the literature here is focused on sexual reproductive health, on HIV, on women's health, and, and really coming from often a situation that these issues impact women, and they're primarily driven through sexual reproductive health. And as you'll see as we go forward, that it turns out that these issues really impact all of us, and so there's been, in, in the first instance, a massive bias in our thinking about where do we even begin to intervene? And it's expressed in, in what comes out in the literature. We did find that three-fourths of the programs did show significant impacts on some gender-related measure, although none of them had a direct measure of a gender norm, uh, of this perception of what's expected of me by society and, and actually measuring that. And so we had to infer that in all cases. Um, 
But in three-fourths of the programs, there were significant improvements in health, as well as some measure uh, related to gender. And we found 10 programs that uh, we deemed to be of the highest quality. And these, these programs looked at a multiplicity of health impacts. They showed spreadability and uh, they, they showed uh, sustainability. Because you think about norms, if, if you could address norms, they're so fundamental, and gender inequalities are so fundamental that often the actions that we need to take are going to have multiple effects on health. If, if, if you're being discriminated against, it's not just gonna affect a nutritional outcome of yours, it's gonna uh, impact all kinds of aspects of your health. And so that stands to reason, and it's a reason to engage in these kinds of programs. We also know that if we can begin to shift norms, uh, this is a way of, of inculcating this into a society and sustaining it. And furthermore, now particularly in, in our age of, of information and spread through social media, et cetera, th these things become very spreadable very quickly. So uh, addressing gender inequalities and norms can become a very powerful way of seeing large population effects on health. One thing uh, that characterized these high quality programs is they tended to act across multiple sectors. They tended to deal with multiple levels of the system, uh, people at different, at different levels within the system, multiple stakeholders. They did not tend to use just one type of approach or one intervention. They tended to bundle things together and, and bring, uh, bring uh, services from multiple angles. And they tended to engage people in the programs. They were not passive recipients, but they actually became active as implementers of the programs themselves. And these were the, these were the factors that, that characterized these successful programs. We looked at the impact of policies on, um, on various aspects of health. We, we looked at countries that had implemented policies around paid maternity and parental leave, and also countries that had initiated tuition-free primary education. Uh, in, in essence, we had about 10 countries that fell into, we had a policy uh, implemented, we had a, a set of control countries which did not implement the policy and followed them longitudinally. And found that if you looked at the institution of these policies, they were related with increased equitable decision making in the home, increasing by about 50%. And then these uh, health impacts, as you see here, with the, uh, the increases compared between the intervention policy implementing and policy lacking countries. And part of the impact um, was mediated by the increased equitable decision making within the home, or a measure that there's something happening within the society to make it more equitable for men and women. We also looked at, uh, uh, how, much, how much time do I have, Mark? Two minutes, oh my gosh. Okay, um, wow, okay, I'm gonna uh, skip and, and flash on here. I, I hope I've convinced you that it's important for health, but I wanna show you a little bit about what we did to try to unpack um, taking new approaches to survey data and understanding how, how did this really impact our health. So this is the approach that we used. We needed to find data where there was some kind of a gendered or sex differential health burden we needed to identify a proxy for a norm. We needed to have identify a reference group because when you have an effect of a norm, it's often you um, discerning that there's somebody else out there who's expecting you to behave or act in a certain way. Who is that? How can we define that quantitatively? Some hypothesis of how a norm leads to a health impact and then the statistical methods to allow you to quantify that. So that, that's basically the process that we used. I may only have time to take you through one, but I think this is kind of an interesting one that illustrates the, the principle. So in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, we observe that adolescent girls are at three times the risk for, a, for HIV, new, new HIV acquisition compared to boys. Why might that be? Well, one of the reasons might be norms. And what we often find in these communities, and this was data from Zambia, we, we found a particular 
instance, we use natural language processing to identify a particular set of questions within DHS surveys. And we found a question that asked about your perception about premarital sex. Is it okay? Should young people wait before marriage to have sex or not? And what we generally found, and we, we took communities within Zambia, identified them by province, found that by and large people were saying you shouldn't have sex before marriage. And then we looked at um, rates of HIV, and we had a measure of their actual behavior uh, based on age at first sex and age at marriage to determine whether that person, in fact, probably had sex before marriage. We, we exploited that variability to look at how does the discordance between what you say as a norm, you shouldn't be having sex, and what actually happened, people in the community saying, we actually don't talk about this, we, we, we don't condone it, we actually do it, and then uh, looking at what, what is the Im impact on HIV acquisition by adolescent girls. Here you see the relationship across provinces that as this discordance uh, between what you say and what you do goes up, which creates a taboo gap where people feel like People are doing it, but they're not talking about it. I can't seek services. I'm kind of on my own. It places girls at increased risk for HIV. We found for every 10% increase in the taboo gap, we saw about a 28% increase in HIV risk. So one example of how we used uh, existing survey data to, to delve into these issues and to show quantitatively the kinds of risks that come through norms, that these risks are affecting all of us as human beings and having enormous impacts on our health. So thank you. Thank you.